Good morning, everyone. I'm glad that you've been able to join us. I wish I could be able to see each one of you and you were able to be here and enjoy the worship as I just did. But we look forward to that day, we hope, sooner than later. If you are joining us online for maybe the very first time, this is a fantastic week to do that. Because we are just now beginning a brand new seven-week series entitled Overcoming Our Enemies. This is a series that we're going to be looking at in weeks to come into Matthew chapter 4 as well as Luke chapter 4. It is on the temptation of Christ by Satan as he, Jesus, began his earthly ministry. And, you know, when you think about this, when you think about what our world is about right now, this is certainly a timely season, a timely reason for doing a series like this as we think about temptation and overcoming enemies, because all of us, to one degree or the other, are dealing now with the threat of COVID-19 over these last two or three months, and now the last few weeks, national unrest and protest. And the truth is, whether we are willing to admit it or not, we are all feeling a little threatened. Our little comfortable world that we had in January when we were looking forward to this new year of 2020 uh, has changed for us, and we feel the threat to our security in some measure, maybe large, maybe small, but we are indeed feeling that. And you know, Satan uses our fears against us during these kinds of times in terms of increasing the temptation against us. You see, Satan wants you and I to react fearfully, which is often to react foolishly, which unfortunately means reacting sinfully because we're acting out of unbelief. That's what fear is. Fear is the unbelief in God's greatness and in God's goodness. And when you think about the contrast between faith and fear, a faith brings us peace while fear causes us to panic. This morning as we begin this series, I want to introduce the topic by giving you, I trust, a firm foundation for resisting temptation, which is in fact to overcome the enemy that attacks us. And I want to talk about, we're going to be talking in several weeks about the whole way that Satan attacked Christ and Jesus responded but this morning, I want to talk to you about an aspect of temptation that we can all easily either ignore or maybe just discount in our daily experience. And that is found in the title of the message we're looking at today, Knowing Our Identity. Knowing Our Identity. I know when you see that, some of you immediately think and ask yourself, or maybe asking out loud in your living rooms this morning, what does my identity have to do with temptation? And you know, that's a great question, and I hope I can answer it fully for you this morning. But let's start in this by understanding that each of us was created to be a divine image bearer. We were made in God's image. And because of that, we do something that no other earthly creature does. Now, maybe the angels have, we don't know, but no other earthly creature does this, and that is we ask ourselves personal questions that demand answers that bring us some level of comfort, of peace of mind. Questions like, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing here? I have a friend over in Fallon that works on my mom's farm equipment. And I was over there a couple months ago, and he's not a religious individual. And he said to me, he said, hey, do you believe in the hereafter? And I thought, oh, I'm going to have a spiritual conversation with him. And I said, yeah, I do believe in the hereafter. He says, me too. He says, I'm at the age now where every time I walk into the room, I say, what am I here after? <laughs> well, that didn't go exactly where I thought it was going. But we do ask those questions. Where am I going? Uh, how am I doing? Why am I here? But you know, the most important question of all that we ask ourselves that gives definition to, the, to all the questions we ask is this question. Who am I? That is a powerful question. And as divine image bearers with self-conscious personhood, with self-awareness, it is the most important question of all that we can ask because it demands we have a satisfying answer. And folks, this aspect of the temptation uh, plays out in a big way in Jesus' uh, temptation. 
If you look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it simply says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So the, the whole temptation of Christ was orchestrated by God so that Jesus would be prepared for what he was about to do, not only with Satan, but in the three years that followed. But for us, this verse should cause us to pause and ask a question and say, wait a minute, that first word, then, what does it mean, then this happened? What happened before the then? And that is the topic of this morning's message. What happened was Jesus' baptism by his cousin John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. Let's stop there for just a second. Let me give you a quick geography lesson. You are aware of how the shape of Israel is today, Palestine, the promised land it was called by the Israelites. In the northwest corner is the Sea of Galilee where Jesus hung out. That's where Nazareth is at and Capernaum he made his home. And he did most of his ministry surrounding that, that lake and sometimes on that lake. And we see the stories in the Gospels about that. That lake is a great source of water for the nation of Israel today. It's fed by Mount Hermon and the mountains surrounding that. And out of the south end of that lake flows the Jordan River. And it flows some 20 or 30 miles, I think, down to the Dead Sea where it ends. And that's where Jericho, the city of Jericho, is located, straight out across from the, over the hills from Jerusalem. And so John the Baptist was there at the, at the mouth of that river, baptizing people and preaching, you know, fire and brimstone, and people from Jerusalem were coming over. And so Jesus leaves his hometown of Nazareth, walks down that, that Jordan River Valley some 20 miles, and shows up to be baptized by John. There is a discussion between them that we're not even going to look at because it would distract us from the topic of today. It simply says, after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he, Jesus, saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. Probably all of us have seen at some point a picture from the Middle Age Renaissance that shows Jesus in the water with a dove on top of his head. That's not exactly what happened. It's not that he came down in the form of a dove, but the focus is on the verb descending as. In other words, he didn't come down like a hawk on his prey, but if you've seen a dove light on a, a power line or something, they come very slowly and softly and lightly and gently onto it. That's what happened here. And this event is like the official public ordaining of Jesus for his ministry. It's, it's the official commissioning. Uh, he leaves Nazareth, so to speak, as the village carpenter. And he comes down here. And once this event is over, he is now the national Messiah of Israel. There's this huge change in his identity happens. A huge upgrade, you might say, of personal identity. I remember when I got done with seminary, I went back home to Fallon, Nevada, to my church, First Baptist had found there, and the pastor called for an ordination council for me, and pastors from Northern California and Nevada came. We met, and I handed out my, my doctrinal statements to them, and they questioned me, and I gave answers, and after several hours or so, they said, okay, we, we think you are qualified to be ordained to be a, a reverend, so to speak. And then there was this service that came, and family came, and all the church people came, and there was music, and there was a message, and so forth. At the end of that service, I was called on stage, and I knelt there on the stage, and, and the elders, and the, and the leaders, and, and pastors, and so forth gathered around me, laid hands on me, and prayed over me, and prayed for me, and for the ministry that God would give me. Well, if you can imagine that, this is as close as it comes, this event here, as God laying hands on his son, the dove comes, the Holy Spirit comes as a dove. But God didn't need to pray like the pastors prayed for me. He didn't need to pray for Jesus. Uh, to God on my behalf, they prayed. But for him, he's God. So he doesn't pray for Jesus. He rather praises him. And this is what he says, verse 17. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, 
This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So let's stop and ask ourselves two questions. Question number one, so why did this happen back then? And question number two, why was it recorded, not once but twice, both in Matthew and Luke, why was it recorded for emphasis sake for us to read some 2,000 plus years later? To be specific, um, how was this important for the human Jesus? And why would it be important to us now? Well, this morning we're going to talk about knowing our identity, and I want to briefly review with you four aspects of identity, of which this event shows the importance, first of all, the, our first point, the power in our identity, the power in it. When the Father spoke from heaven, he did not preach a sermon. He did not offer multiple platitudes. He simply made two very brief statements. But both of those statements spoke strategic truth into the heart and life of Jesus that really speak to two created needs of personhood that all of us feel, each one of us. Uh, the need for security and the need for significance. Let's review what the Father said. The first thing he told Jesus was, you are my beloved son. And that three words speaks each one strategically into the relational acceptance that Jesus was going to need, the security he was going to need, as he began a life of opposition, of challenge, of rejection, and finally of the cross. That the human Jesus, though his form has changed since eternity past, he is still my beloved son. Nothing's changed in our relationship. You're still my son. Jesus never forgot this affirmation. He never forgot who he was. Never. Uh, from this ministry start in the, in the wilderness facing Satan in years that would come after that uh, to his high priestly prayer in John 17 in the last in the upper room after that, even to the cross, he never forgot who he was. Look at the second statement. I am well pleased. Here's a statement, a tremendous statement of personal approval that you are important to me. You are significant. You have it together. I believe you are great. I'm well pleased with you. You know, I am a part of the baby boomer generation, as I know some of you are who are listening this morning. And that means we were all raised by the GI generation. And I think back of my upbringing and my GI dad who spent his youth, his childhood, teenage years in a depression, in a family of eight without a father. I think about him as a young man going off to war in World War II. And I remember him used to telling me on many occasions that he was raised in the school of hard knocks. And knowing how hard life could be, my dad never really understood and never really was taught probably the three phases of parenting. And maybe some of you this morning don't really realize the three stages of parenting, but let me briefly give them to you. You start out as a parent, as a caregiver. Uh, you can hold that newborn in either one hand or two hands, and you do literally everything for them, right? I mean, everything. Their very existence depends on your care of them. You're the caregiver. But eventually, they get older, and they begin to talk and understand, and, and you begin to become the second part in your second phase of parenting. You become the coach. You begin to tell them how to uh, put on their clothes, feed themselves, uh, tie their shoes, clean their room. And then it gets beyond that. You begin to share your values, your life paradigm with them. You begin to prepare them for adult, respons self-responsible adulthood. And you pour your life into them as the coach. But eventually that child becomes a teenager. Uh, they begin to go through that adolescent a tunnel through uh, into adulthood. And so your role changes as their 
uh, peers became more important to, than their parents to, to them. Uh, you become not just their coach, but that role fades, and you simply become their cheerleader. Yeah, yeah, you can make it. We believe in you. Keep going. You're going to win. I mean, you become the cheerleader because they're not listening to you as a coach much, and they, like you, are going to have to learn the rest of those lessons that you implanted into them through the life of hard knocks, through their life reproves that they experience. Well, I tell you that because my dad never learned that final aspect. He was always the coach. He was always trying to prepare me for the worst case scenario that he had experienced himself. And so what I heard often as a teenager growing up was a statement, well, that was okay, but, but you should have thought of this. You could have done that. Next time, think of this. It was always, that's okay, but. And I know his motive was to try to help me prepare for adulthood. His motive was well-intentioned. But what I often felt was his disapproval and rejection. Many of you can relate to that with a father who was like that or maybe an absentee father who offered nothing to you. But I can tell you those unintended but deep-seated pains of personal identity can take literally years to overcome. It probably took me 20 or 25 years into my late 30s to finally transfer who I was going to listen to from my earthly father to my eternal father. And some never do. Maybe that's you this morning. They never do because of the pain and the power in that pain. Well, I tell you that because I want you to notice the human Jesus did not have to contend with any of that negative fear from his father. And really, when you think back, that's why dads never become the cheerleader and always the coach, and maybe moms as well, because they're afraid for their child. They know the, how a, a decision at 18 can impact them all the way to 35. They have made those mistakes. They're trying to keep their children from having the same kinds of consequences. And so out of fear of the future, they continue to be the coach. But Jesus didn't have to contend with that. He only received a divinely powerful statements of personal approval. You are my beloved son. We are relationally accepted. You are connected to me. And I am well pleased. Personal approval. You are a significant person. And so this is what it meant for Jesus then. Because he never forgot who he was, because the father's voice was always in his, in his heart, in his ears, he never did anything out of the fear of unbelief. He never had any confusion of his person or purpose, like, who am I? Ah, what am I going to do? They all rejected me. Oh, what should I do next? The human Jesus when he was in those situations and didn't know, he prayed to the Father. He, he never worried or fearfully reacted foolishly to life's opportunities and challenges. Unfortunately, we do both. We, we at times worry, and other times we fearfully react foolishly to life. And we do that a lot. And that's why this is in the Bible for us. Because, you see, God created human beings with those same two felt identity needs for both security and significance. Why? Because he created us in his image, we are significant, and because he created us in his image to love us, we need that sense of security. And so, those first human beings on planet Earth, who they were defined what they did. You say, what, what did they do? Well, they copied what God did. They ruled and they give identity to every living thing under them, while at the same time staying relationally connected to and affirmed by their creator God. And folks, if that situation had remained unchanged, if, if they would have been confirmed in righteousness, listen, we would all be living heaven on earth. The world history would be completely different, and we would be completely different. But as we well know, things did not remain unchanged. And so what we learn in God's story is it reveals early on, the second thing I want to mention to you, the perversion of our identity. How our identity got changed from what we were created to be 
to what became of us after this. This story is found in Genesis chapter 3, and I just want to touch a little piece of it this morning. In the temptation, it says, uh, Satan comes to the couple and he says to them, Indeed has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. A distortion of that. The serpent goes on to say after this dialogue with a woman, he says to her, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes are going to be open. You're going to have so much insight on how things really are, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When you listen to what Satan said in that initial temptation, his approach was to question God's command, to deny its, to deny its consequences, discredit the motives behind it, and then to distort the benefits of the disobedience. He says, if you do this, you'll be like God. But wait, stop. Say, they were already like God. God had created them to be like him. So they didn't need to do anything else. They didn't need to do anything more to be like God. That was Satan's perversion of our identity. It was, his, it was his distortion of the benefit of disobedience. That knowing evil was going to be a good thing. Hey, you're going to get to know evil. What Satan didn't mention was the obvious. And that was the only way for man to know the difference between good and evil was to personally experience evil and its consequence. So when man took the bait, he lost connection to God along with that God-given affirmation of his security and significance. A fear entered into his world and man was left to himself to find his own significance and security. And folks, this is the world we live in today with everyone fearful of not being fully accepted, everyone fearful of not being totally approved. And for that reason, it's why we are still so vulnerable to Satan's temptation to do something, to take the bait in order to be something more than we think we are. I need to do something more to be better. That's the temptation we face in that quest for that hunger for significance and security. In fact, the point here is this. Believing our creature doing whether it's religiously, vocationally, financially, educationally, you pick the path, everybody's on several, believing our creature doing can somehow improve our God-created being, who he made us to be. That remains our daily temptation. And as we find in Scripture, whether it be in Ecclesiastes, a Solomon's story, or we look around the news, what we discover is that that is a lose-lose fear-based pursuit because you can never do enough ever to be certain, to be sure of your security or your significance. Oh, you can have some moments of victory, but then it all fades and you go right back to feeling insecure and not significant. The truth is our human hunger, and it is a human hunger, our human hunger for acceptance and approval is a human appetite that can never be satisfied by human actions because it'll never be enough. Folks, our solution is not to do more, but to be restored to God's creation life paradigm of allowing our being, who we are in Christ, to define our doing, which is what Jesus lived out. And that really is the gospel. That is the good news uh, about who Jesus is, the incarnate Son, and what he has done for us, dying on the cross, taking care of the sin issue, so that God could be both just and merciful, and so that we could be restored to our original relationship with God. And that's the gospel that Jesus has restored for all who would choose to believe. Choose to believe who he is, and choose to believe what he's done, Jesus has restored the purpose of our identity. He's restored the purpose. It is a human identity that has been restored not 
not by simply remodeling, but by rebirth as a start over. It's a new beginning, not a physical birth, obviously, but as Jesus said in John 3, it is a spiritual birth from above, from heaven, by the Father. And as you read through your New Testament epistles, this is God's affirmation of us over and over again that we are his faith children, that we don't have to do any more. That's the cry of temptation. That's the appeal. You need to do something more. We don't have to do anything more. We just need to realize who we are. That's the beginning point of facing this world and the temptation in it, realizing who we are. Why is that so important? Because, here's the point, when our eternal being, who we are in creation and who we are by redemption, begins to direct our earthly doing, we begin to act out of who we are, what we do glorifies our Savior. And that's the purpose of why we are here. That is the purpose of your identity, is to glorify your Creator. Sp Peter spoke to this in 1 Peter chapter 2 when he said this. He said, you also, as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house, a house God lives in, for a holy priesthood. That's who you are, Christian friend. You are a holy priesthood, a part of it. And what do priests do? They offer up spiritual sacrifices that are now acceptable to God because they're coming through Jesus Christ and his righteousness that we are a part of. That's what we do. He goes on to say in verse 9 of that chapter... You are a chosen race. God has chosen you. You are a royal priesthood, not just a holy priesthood, but also a royal priesthood like Christ after the order of Melchizedek, Hebrews chapter 7, in which you are a king priest. You have royalty now in you. You are a holy nation. You are a people for God's own possession. And why are all these things true of us? What's the purpose there? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him, God's greatness, his goodness, of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, this is our restored divine purpose. It's, it's much grander as you look at the different identities given. It's obviously much grander and larger than the original creation purpose because it's now much more personal. It's now much more relationally connected and it's much more eternal now that we are, each of us, a part of God's adoptive family. We are God's adoptive children, each of us. We are a member of his forever family. And I say that because at times it doesn't feel that way, does it? In fact, right now we live in the midst of a broken world that is filled with threats to our security. And with those threats to our security of these unknown and now seen issues of going and facing and breaking up our little safe world, we also have the temptation increased to our significance to do something more. The truth is, our restored identity in Christ can seem so beyond our both mental and emotional grasp. And who we truly are can seem unreal uh, to, our, to our daily experience. Well, the truth is, folks, that isn't any different than those very first century believers. In fact, it might even have been harder for them than us because most of them didn't have the buffer of a first world comfort and affluence like we do here in America where we can kind of feel like we are in control and we're safe because we have double locks on our doors. The truth is every generation of Christians, first century or 21st century, Christians, each one has their own specific temptation to to overcome of unbelief and fear and panic. And each of us, by God's grace, by faith, we are all awaiting the same finish line. And that's the fourth aspect of identity I want to share with you this morning, the perfecting of our identity. The perfecting of our identity. John speaks of that in 1 John chapter 3, and he has this amazing statement. He says, See... How great a love the Father has bestowed on us. Stop there. Let me ask you this morning. Do you see that for yourself? Have you personally 
apprehended that love and you understand that you would include yourself in the us that John says the Father has bestowed on us, he says that we would be called children of God and such we are. Beloved, now we are children of God and yet it's not appeared as yet what we will be. We still have these same bodies and stay on fading mortality, don't we? But he says, we know that, we, that when he appears, when Jesus appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And to be in the presence of that Shekinah glory and see him as he is, we will need to be like him. That's John's point. So remember where we started this morning with the power of identity is a tremendous power within us when it's given out of a father's love to his child as God the Father gave it to Jesus. But notice now we have come full circle as we have now experienced this great love of divine scope of immeasurable love in which now the Father is extending that same loving equation from Jesus to us. He says, first of all, we are called children of God. That's what God calls us, his children. That is an eternally secure identity for us. We belong in Jesus' eternal family. This is our personal identity. This is how God will forever identify you. And this is how you will, he will know you. And, and listen, this is how he will call for you. My beloved child. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> no wonder John said, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that this could actually happen and will happen. Right now, our fading mortality gives us no hint, gives us no comparison, no, no human idea, really, of what is coming for us. But by faith in God's greatness and goodness, we have this inner confidence, we have this abiding hope that John speaks to here, that we will be like him, each one of us in Christ. We will be eternally significant as we reflect Jesus' eternal form of existence. I mean, think about this with me. Folks, there is, there is no greater significance that one can obtain in the universe than being personally identified. I mean, personally connected, identified with Jesus, the second person of the Godhead. Wow. And so we wait. Each and every day we wake up and we wait for that perfecting. And each and every day we choose. We either choose to believe this good news. And in believing this good news, we then can rejoice and rest in our restored divine, divine identity. Or we wake up and we choose to disbelieve it. And then we are left to fear and fret over life's greatest question. Who am I really today? It's my prayer for each of us and for you that you will let the Savior, Jesus, not Satan, the deceiver, define who you are because that still small voice of the spirit is going to be telling you one thing while the loud screaming voices of this world generated by Satan are going to be telling you the other thing you're a nobody and you need to do something more to be truly acceptable to God to be someone I pray in days to come you will understand the power of your identity in God, that you are a beloved son, that he is well pleased with you, and you'll be aware of the perversion of thinking that somehow by your human doing, you're gonna be able to improve on God's creation and redemption. That rather you will embrace the purpose of your identity of simply glorifying our God and who he has made us to be and who he has redeemed us. And everything we do, whether it's taking a drink or doing work or offering a prayer, as we do it and who we are, it glorifies our Father. And you await in hope, as each generation of saints have waited, 
for that perfecting of identity when he will call us into his presence and we will be like him, our Savior, forevermore as we step from time and history into eternity future. My prayer is that you'll let Jesus, the Savior, define you and rest and rejoice in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for these powerful words in the scripture of identity and the focus that you are trying to direct us to, to, to allow your, your salvation, your power to be part of our lives, that we can be restored from the version that's happened to the human race and we can embrace truly the purpose for which you created us and we can wait in hope and confidence in the perfecting of that identity in Christ. Father, may you truly take each one of us into that place where we can personally say, I know whom I have believed and I am confident that he will complete in me what he began that day. Father, we pray that for each and every one who hears and is watching today and later. In Christ's name, amen. And next week, we're going to continue the series. Brian will be back to talk about knowing the enemy. We'll look more at Satan in this regard. And uh, again, as mentioned earlier by Brad, if you do have a prayer request, if you're struggling with something now, do pray that you'll go online to pray at gracechico.org, and, uh, and we'll be happy to pray for you each and every week. God bless you. Hope to see you next week. Take care.